Thank you so much for joining me today to watch this recording of the first part of our two-part wildlife photography webinar series with Bruno De Amici. It was a pleasure to host this series and I very much hope you enjoy the recording. For a little extra information, this webinar has been brought to you today through a partnership by Canon Europe and Earthwatch Europe. Earthwatch Europe are an environmental charity and we're working on projects across the UK and Europe with the aim to reconnect people with nature and to live within our means. We strive for our work to enable action to help mitigate the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. And in doing so, we work with a number of partners, including Canon Europe, who have very kindly helped bring this webinar to us today in support of our ongoing and collaborative Wild Cities photo competition. This is a UK amateur photo competition where we're encouraging people to get outside, enjoy nature in their cities, and to get stuck in and take part. It's also supporting part of Earthwatch Europe's wider work, which is our Tiny Forest programme, where we plant small tennis size court forests in urban areas to really bring these little pockets of nature back to urban spaces. And of course, to help people connect with nature. So for every entry to this competition, Canon Europe will give five pounds to Earthwatch Europe to fund the creation of a new tiny forest. So it really is all going to a great cause. So if you're interested in wildlife photography and fancy having a go at yourself, you're certainly in the right place. And I very much hope you enjoy this webinar. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Bruno. He is a photojournalist and filmmaker with a strong focus on wildlife and nature conservation. The background in wildlife ecology, he has a passion for the diversity of life across our incredible world. He has worked as a full-time nature photographer now since 2004 and is proud to be a Canon ambassador. Please sit back, relax and enjoy this wonderful presentation. Um, I decided to make uh, a living with photography because uh, of all the things I've experienced, photography is the closest that could um, uh, give satisfaction to my, let's say, quench my thirst for nature, for diversity. Um, right now, uh, as much as, uh, as well as I, uh, when I was a child, I'm still fascinated by so many wonders of nature. Um, for example, the simple magic and nuptial flights of the fireflies and uh, the display on, on a summer evening. Uh, here is on a barley field, but it could be any, anywhere. And um, to find uh, answers to those questions, first, uh, I pursued a career uh, in wildlife ecology. So I went to university, I did all my studies, I studied wildlife research, but that was not enough. Uh, there was always more. I, I liked everything, maybe because, you know, uh, of uh, a little bit of, um, so to say, gluttony for, for nature. But I wanted to, to experience places and meet people and, uh, and get uh, my, you know, my fingers uh, wet, uh, dip my fingers into many, many different topics. So how did, did it all uh, start? Um, as, a, as a teenager, you know, 13, 13, 14, I was already super fascinated about animals, especially in nature. And I lived in a big city. I was born in Rome. I lived in uh, in an era without any green, I would say. So the, the most uh, nature that I could get was through the pages, flipping through the pages of books and magazines. Uh, yeah, that was the era of magazines. I feel like a dinosaur now talking about magazines. Of course, there was no internet. Uh, nature photography was... Uh, an awkward uh, concept uh, for Italy in the in the early nineties, and I started um, painting, sketching, doing some uh, you know like uh, keep uh, track of the observation and the encounters because uh, I had the fortune that uh, my father's family comes from a little village in the mountains. We'll get there uh, later, and they were my my escapes. That was the place where I could actually you know really satisfy my curiosity. But I was frustrated because I really sucked as a, as a drawer, as an illustrator. And I looked at all this beautiful picture on National Geographic, other magazines. And uh, I decided to try and pick uh, photography. Uh, I, I was 13. I picked my first uh, camera was my father's camera, a camera from the 60s, actually from the 68. And it was a film camera, of course. It was very slow, very dark lenses, very difficult to photograph. And many years later, I still have the same passion for photography. Why photography? 
soon after overcoming the obvious uh, technical requirements behind photography, which sometimes scare people. But they, believe me, I really, really sucked at the beginning. It's like when you buy a guitar, at least I did buy a guitar, and then you get stuck with the very first lesson and you think, oh, I suck too much, I'm too bad, I will never keep, keep, uh, keep up. Instead, if you keep trying, if you love it, one day magically pictures start to look good. And, uh, and of course, you also need good critics. You need to, you know, uh, engage yourself in conversation with other people. Now we have uh, social media, we have competition, we have many platforms on which you can show your work. But what is most important, you must have fun with it. So photography for me was, first of all, a way to record uh, moments, those timeless moments that actually when your, your heart start pounding fast because finally you encounter the animal in a beautiful location. And then it's about uh, it's about beauty. It's about light. It's about colors. My photography is very simple. I don't. I tend to make pictures that are quite um, close as close as possible to reality. Uh, I like primary colors. Uh, I like to over when uh, you know, for example, the blues of the the snow in the background make the the reddish fox stand out. So it's about being in the right place at the right time. Uh, time, And to do so, it means knowing your subject very well and being, of course, very, very patient because photography, good nature photography, takes a lifetime. So um, please, someone say, if everything is okay, if you hear me, just say, yeah, we hear you because I, I'm talking to myself at the moment. All going smoothly. We can hear you. Thank you. Super. So um, fast forward. 2023, my career. Um, I um I started my business in 2004. So after the university and a bit of academic uh, experience, I took the plunge and I decided to turn a professional. And now I have, uh, yeah, I've, <laughs> people call me a veteran in this business, but uh, I had uh, the satisfaction of being of my pictures being published worldwide, including media like Na National Geographic, BBC One Life. Maybe it's closer to the UK uh, audience, our K audience of today, and uh, talk to many audiences uh, in theaters, festivals around the world, and and earn um, some recognition, uh, namely Wildlife Photographer of the Year, WordPress uh, photos, or important competitions. Nothing that you know for me is relevant per se, but everything shows uh, me a direction. So I like to have. Uh, when I publish a book or I get a, a nice um, publication on a magazine or an award, for me, it's a milestone on my on my path, which never stops. And I will never probably quit because I love it so much. And for me, it's a lifestyle. So it's, it's I don't mind if I have to work 365 days per year, but I'm happy and uh, it's the life I chose. And eventually, a few years ago, I also became Canon ambassador after a lifetime spent photographing with their equipment. And this is cool because it can help me to implement other activities. Like today, I'm super happy to talk to you because the topics we'll touch today are very close to my heart. So yeah, something about my vision. I am, uh, I would say, a gourmand, a connoisseur of light. I love light. Uh, photography from the Greek, photographia means to write with light. I mean, I don't need to, <laughs> to tell this to everyone, but it's uh, very important that light is pivotal. doesn't matter if you have a strong subject like this Capercaeli, which is an endangered species in Italy, I think as well as in the UK and uh, in many countries, is a bird that is not doing very well. Um, light adds the magic. Also, I am, um, I am striving to, to get pictures that convey a sense of wilderness, even in Europe. This picture that you see, it's a mother up and down bear with her two cubs. One cub you don't see because it's half hidden behind the mom. It's walking on a, on a spring meadow in the Apennines, in close to Rome. This is where I live and this is where I'm talking to you from. It's central Italy. So this is not Canada or Alaska, it's Italy. And just behind those mountains is Naples. So you can imagine the, the wonder of the survival of the small population of bears. Why I like this kind of uh, framing, I don't look so much for portraits. I mean, they're important, of course, for a story, but I like to, uh, to give atmosphere, to bring my audience with me uh, during my hikes, during my explorations. Because, uh, you know, when you also keep uh, distance from the animal, you also give justice to the world it lives in and tells a bit of the ecology. And also it shows respect because not every animal is happy to have us around. So it's good to have an etiquette and know when it's good to get close or it's good to uh, hold back and give animals space. 
So this approach allowed me to photograph even uh, very skittish wildlife. This is a wild wolf with this picture. I won an important award in 2020. But this is not so relevant about the award per se, but this picture is very important to me. First of all, because I spent uh, a, a good chunk of my life photographing wild wolves. I published a book eight years ago about them, the first book in Europe about, about wild wolves. But what is important that this picture has been taken on the solstice of winter 2020. If you remember, 2020 was a pandemic year. It was a tough year for everyone. So having this, this moment, this magic moment between shadow and light, the, the shortest day of the year, the beginning of winter, and this beautiful animal crossing these two worlds, creating this magic atmosphere, and me being able still to witness this, this magic every time uh, I go out. Uh, it was a, a strong, strong... Uh, encouragement to keep up you know despite the difficulties of that year and keep up trying to make uh you know a good job and keep up the good work hopefully other pictures uh you know in my career this is uh, again a picture from from italy uh today i will show you a lot of pictures from my own country just to say that not everything has to be taken far away these are apennine chamois which is a unique uh species to the apennines again mountains and this picture has been taken with the moonlight this was 2010. The, the keeper was already coping very well with uh, with the night and, uh, and low light and uh, high ISO. But uh, now, of course, the results would be even more incredible. What is nice is that the the mist in the in the background uh, surrounding the valley and the villages down 2,000 meters, which is about uh, 6,000 feet, maybe. Yeah below uh took this pink hue and then the, the the moonlight was giving this blue cast to the, to the to the clouds creating these dreamy pictures so i like to combine science place a sense of place and colors i like colors i do some black and white but i'm a color photography and i see the world in color definitely after um, uh, in my career i've been traveling to some 50 plus countries and this is me camping in the Caucasus Mountains in, in Georgia. Uh, I went to the Arctic to see the killer whales or orcas. Uh, I went to the tropics. This is uh, one of the last remnant forests uh, in Ethiopia. Actually, this is for a story on church forest. There are tiny parcels of forest, some as big as a tennis uh, field. So a tennis course. So actually very, very close to the topic of the tiny forest. And they are protected because they are considered sacred. And in one of the largest of this forest in the south of the country, I came across, uh, uh, I would say, uh, I, a legend materialized in front of my camera. I've heard about lions living in these places. We are at a very high altitude, 2,900, almost 3,000 meters above sea level. So cloud. <coughs> sorry so cloud forest and there was a lion there in the evening and i was hiking uh, with my guide i was not uh on a on a on a, on a land rover or you know behind uh, any sort of protection so to say and i could take this picture because the animal was very relaxed and these are the first images ever taken of a lion in that place and this was a remark uh, of the fact that uh, traveling with preconceived ideas with the typical westerner approach of like you know fact science this is impossible not listening to local folklore and rumors it's a mistake it's important always to keep open for um yeah local intelligence because uh, at the end sometimes the reality is more surprising than fantasy and one of the stories that is the closest to my heart, it's a story I followed uh, over many years in the Sahara Desert, uh, looking for very tiny special animals. I crossed these uh, stretches of dunes between Algeria and Tunisia over many years, first as a camera, uh, as a photographer, now as a camera operator, to look for the most beautiful animal there is in the world for me, which is the fennec fox. It's a small fox, the smallest uh, dog-like animal in the world. It's about... Uh, one kilo and a half heavy, but with the largest ears uh, in proportion to the body. And uh, these are, you know, already old pictures, but uh, this is a picture taken with a camera trap because the animal is super skittish, super elusive, most of the time only active at night, but lives in this beautiful place with, uh, you know, the night, is, the, the starry sky is crazy. And I wanted to give justice to this, this the beauty of this place by having a long 
uh, exposure. So the animal would have been frozen, so to say, by the flashlight, and then the camera would stay open to record the light of the moon on the dunes and the stars. What is important is that in this picture, there used to be three flashes, but night after night, uh, the gerbils, which are rodents, mouse-like animals in the desert, ate every single cable around. So they left me with one working flash, and I was hoping, praying every night that they wouldn't touch that uh, that cable as well so i had to lift it on sticks and keep it far away from the ground and eventually after 40 days i got this picture which was a great reward yeah uh but let's go back to where it all started so by now you should have a very very fast idea of who am i and what i do and what i did over the past 20 years uh, of course, you can then, uh, at the end, I will give you um, some uh, directions for my website, my social media pages. I'm not the most active social person, but uh, I'm definitely happy to share things with others and to see what I'm doing, what I'm up to. But in general, uh, this is more or less what I do. I have a very selfish job. I like to pursue my dreams <laughs> and trying to make them interesting for others and trying to convey um a message for, for conservation, for, for respect first and foremost, but also for the joy of nature. These all started not in my hometown, not in Rome, but in this tiny village in the Italian uh, Apennine Mountains. It's a small village where I say my father's family comes from and we had the opportunity to spend the summers, the spring holidays, and this place meant freedom, freedom to go uh, cycling, fishing, camping, making a house on trees. It was the, the idyllic place. And it, it was and still is partially very, um, very much uh, non-exploited. So even the cultivations wouldn't use pesticides, allowing this fantastic blooming of flowers at the end of spring, so spontaneous flowers. Uh, there would be fascinating biodiversity made of the tiniest things like this, this moths or uh, bigger things. And uh, I would be yeah, going around at night with a torch, uh, look for tree frogs in spring, following their, their choir, choir or for the fireflies at the beginning. So it was a, was a kind of a training ground for me to, to, uh, to become a better naturalist and to start to believe in myself. I also appreciate that in the Apennines, nature uh, and culture are always mingling. They are not separated. Millennia of human presence on these mountains left uh, a strong, strong uh, footprint, but not always negative. For example, the sheep husbandry has been kind of molding the landscape and creating a lot of opportunities for biodiversity, for orchids, for, for larks, for other birds to survive and creating open land for a golden eagle to hunt. So it, it was uh, a kind of uh, beneficial um activity that created a landscape mosaic which we have now and is extremely rich in biodiversity. Italy just by numbers it's uh, Europe most biodiverse country and the region Abruzzo where I live where I chose to to establish myself it is one of the richest of the country. But in the Apennines there are also big mountains relatively big and as a child they re represented almost uh, a barrier uh, a magic barrier Imagine from the perspective of a six-year-old, a seven-year-old child interested in nature, they were as high as the Himalayas or the Karakorum. They look impossible to overcome. But I knew that behind those mountains, they were hiding spirits and ghosts. All the wildlife that I dreamt of meeting, uh, deer, wolves, uh, chamois, eagle, and especially the king of this era, the brown bear, the last 50, 60 brown bears of the Apennines. So over the years, I had to, first of all, overcome all my fears, uh, overcome my technical limits and get confident enough to set on um, solitary trips because eventually um, the people who introduced me to nature when I was a child, like my father, some, some family friends, they got they got bored or they got overwhelmed with my passion because I wanted to go every day out. I wanted to go out very early and stay up until late. And actually, they just wanted to have a nice stroll, maybe going to pick some mushrooms while I wanted to wait for that specific bird to perch. So sooner or later, I, I figured out that I had to do this thing alone. And at the end, at the beginning, it took some courage because I was really afraid to 
go alone. Uh, but then eventually I managed to analyze my fears and get to know myself and the places so well that I got very confident. And of course, always with the due respect. But life is weird. I mean, after this uh, important time as a teenager, um, visually enjoying nature, uh, learning to explore the mountains, finishing, uh, completing my, my master in, in biology, uh, I would have expected to set uh, to settle in one of the local national park or protected areas. Instead, I decided to move to one of Europe's largest capital and move to Berlin. So at the beginning of the 2000s, um, I moved to the capital of Germany because uh, I knew back then that in Germany there were maybe 50, 60 full-time nature photographers. In Italy, there were two or three, and we still are two or three full-time nature photographers. So I thought maybe there is something special in Germany. Maybe there is a secret to to make a career, to the, to pursue a career as a nature photographer. Consider that around me, despite the support of my parents, everybody kept telling me, it's impossible. You will never be able to make a living as a nature photographer. This world, impossible, impossible. The more I heard this word, the more I wanted to actually show people that it was doable because someone in the world could do it. And of course, I could not become a football player because I never liked football. I couldn't become maybe, I'm not the most sporty guy, but I say, I have, uh, I think I have the guts to become a full-time professional photographer. The issue is when I moved to Germany and uh, of course, Berlin was also a very cool place to live as a 25 year old uh, uh, person, uh, plenty of activities and, uh, and youth. And of course, you know, Berlin, Berlin is a really cool place. So I was, let's say sometimes a bit distracted from nature, but nature was everywhere in the city. So I, I joined the, the local photography scene, the German uh, photography scene, and there were, and there still are some amazing photographers among them. And I started looking at their work and, and humbly showing mine, which I, it was very, very rough and imperfect. And, uh, and all these photographers uh, were traveling to Kenya, to the Serengeti, to Antarctica, to the Svalbard, to Alaska. And they had this big, long lens. Some of them were sporting this white Canon lens, like massive. And I was completely broke. I mean, I opened my uh, business in 2004, but I, me and the finance department we were the only two knowing in the world that I was a full-time professional photographer because no one was calling me. No one was asking for to buy pictures. And I was very frustrated. I was broke. I was ambitious, but at the same time, I didn't have the, the means. But then, you know, in necessity is a, sometimes becomes a virtue. And I realized that I lived in a city which was teeming with wildlife and very, very interesting. So I decided to, to invest time in searching animals in the, in the urban surroundings of Berlin. As you know, Berlin was uh, like a bit like London, was born of small cities that join eventually together. And this origin has allowed a lot of green areas to survive within the, the boundaries of the, of the municipality of Berlin. So it's uh, one of the greenest area, uh, cities in, in the world. And uh, again, it's full of magic, uh, fantastic species. In this picture, you see the peregrine falcon flying against the the um, TV tower of Alexanderplatz, one of the symbols of the city. So I spent a lot of time. I went around with uh, public transportation by bike. Uh, I made friendship with uh, dog walkers, um, retired people, gardeners, uh, some foresters. And I became like a ghostbuster. When there would be a raccoon, because there are raccoons, in, or uh, like a fox in the garden, I would get a phone call and I had a big map of Berlin on, on, the, on, on my wall and I put a pin and I would jump on my, uh, on my bike or on the subway and just reach this place and get pictures. These are rooks and crows uh, flying back to the roost in the evening in winter from uh, with the skyline of Berlin, taken from one of the highest uh, buildings in the center. These are pictures that, uh, you know, now start to be 20, year, 20 year, years old. What is important is that uh, by uh, assuming this discipline of working on a project, instead of looking for single images, but thinking of an entire body of work, I was able at the end to amass so many images that this, uh, um, let's say, shortcoming of mine of not being able to travel to exotic location, not having these long lenses, these fantastic cameras, but having entry level 
equipment allowed me to be to offer a more interesting perspective. And this whole project, especially I was fond of foxes. I mean, speaking to UK based people, this might be an obvious uh, um, so to say aspect of their of their life. But also in Berlin, there are so many foxes and no one was paying attention to them. So I spent quite some time uh, getting to know the single individuals and eventually get uh, acquainted with a family, with, uh, with pups and follow them during their development. Uh, every suitable habitat is used by foxes in Berlin. And I like to frame them in these weird uh, conditions, you know, in, in, uh, in a work site, on a construction site and uh, uh, following the pups growing older in a, near, in a nearby garden uh, and eventually get so much um, confidence with uh, with the vixen that I could crawl really literally with a wet angle under while she was nursing her pups and, and frame against uh, the family, against uh, the, the local buildings to give this urban look. What is important is that at the end, I could, this project was bought in, in its entirety by the municipality of Berlin and um, the office for the environment. And they made a book and was my first book and actually also my first check my first uh, salary as a photographer. And I bought a big lens after and I started finally setting off as a nature photographer. So that was a very, very important experience. And this is why today I want to show you this, uh, this um, vintage pictures to say that uh, even, you know, uh, trying to pursue uh, a career of uh, a traveler, uh, traveling nature photographer around the world, actually you start from very close. Everything comes together and... Uh, the, the discipline, the techniques that you learn, the tricks, the patience, all applies everywhere. Um, we jump again, uh, fast forward, and we move back to where I am now. Actually, I am in this village in the moment where I'm talking to you. This is called Pettorano. It's a tiny village. We are 300 people still living in it. As you can see, uh, there were many more living in the past. But as, you, as it happens to many rural areas uh, across Europe, there has been an exodus towards the large cities. So this village is mostly empty, but now it's getting recolonized by younger people. And we are creating a community of people interested in nature and, um, and wildlife and uh, sustainable ag agriculture and tourism. It's considered one of the most beautiful villages in Italy. It has uh, a certificate for that. And especially it's a place where me and my family, I have two children, can enjoy seasons and nature on our doorstep. Um, what happened here? I moved here in 2021. So after, I'm already living in the region since 2008, so it's 15 years. I came back to, to my roots from Berlin, from uh, other places in the world. I decided to move to the, the heart of Italy. And uh, I moved here in 2021 because we really liked this atmosphere and this place. And um, I didn't know very well the area and I didn't know very well the village nor the people living here. So I decided to take on a project and use my camera to explore this, to create a kind of visual diary of Pettorano and its surroundings. So this is, for example, is one of the very round mountains that we have close to our village. It doesn't look like, but here we are at 2000 meters above sea level. So it's quite high. And basically this exercise, uh, also exploring the surroundings together with my children was super useful because uh, I got to know, I got first of all to feel the rhythm of the season and the changes, you know, the very early signs of spring when the almond trees start to bloom and there is still snow on the mountains the spectacle salamanders that come out in uh, late April. Here, this is a, a species uh, endemic, which means unique to Italy. And uh, it's a very small, uh, it's a very small amphibian, but when <clears throat> you approach it too close, it flips its tail and makes this ring to show this red color because it's, it's toxic. And in this way, it shows a potential predator that is not good to eat. And so uh, these pictures all belong to this kind of very, a spontaneous project of like exploring uh, and feel free. I use I didn't use a tripod for this project. I had uh, one of the new mirrorless cameras, which is really lightweight and very easy to use. And I really enjoyed just you know uh, keeping every day some time to to go and photograph hiking uh, the nature reserve because the village is within a nature reserve. Anxiously, anxiously wait for the orchids to come out, but even playing with more common plants. This is a thistle. This is a, a globe thistle 
very common on the on the roadside and just you know in this case i deliberately defocused but also stopped down the, the f-stops to get a bit of uh, detail just to create this kind of eerie uh, alien-like um, shapes or maybe just get uh, over um, mesmerized by the beauty of um, of the wing of a jay a dead jay that i found on the side of the street with my kids we looked at it that it's beautiful colors and i took some just some macro shots just you know keep uh this was a lucky observation out of the window we have a uh, little olive growth and uh yeah there was a roe deer just you know, oblivious to our presence uh, sometimes uh, it's bad weather you stay inside but then there is a butterfly reminding you of uh of, this is not my window otherwise it would be too dirty it's it's on the stairways but anyway just to show how you know we look outside and this is what we see so the nature uh it's very close to us and um uh, on those uh, pinkish mountains you can see chamois wolves and bears so with with a scope or if you hike there but uh i like this mosaic landscape where human life and uh and nature are two gradients that touch each other and then it's nice that to see kids that can play the little group of kids that still are in this village although the school is still active playing outside in the square and with them we can uh, enjoy nature and show um actually even the little beauty because uh the most important thing is that what i learned over the years the emotion that can give you an encounter with a lion or a bear or, or a rare species are immense but the pleasure of of a daily connection with nature of knowing your local patch so well that you you can anticipate the blooming of a certain flower species or you can recognize a bird just by its call that's priceless for me it is the most uh incredible reward that you can have after a lifetime paying attention to nature and probably is the only way we can connect kids to and without uh, kids uh being interested in nature to real nature uh, then there is i think not so much hope for for our future and uh this village is also very nice in summers i invite you all to visit here you, this is the main square this is in the evening in summer we can just you know sit outside and chill and it's nice you can walk around the streets and spot the geckos because it can be very warm and we have this uh this very nice uh, reptile species at night hunting uh, moths and flies on the on the lantern in the streets this is the view in autumn that shows the proximity between the village and uh, and the mountain. What, why I'm showing you these pictures is because the, you know not so much about how how maybe picturesque this can be, but for the fact that uh, even uh, a consumed photographer, as I call myself, needs this everyday proximity to nature. And uh, when I mean nature, I mean the plurality of life. It's an inclusive term. It includes also us and our culture and our differences and personal tastes and uh, and and characteristics. I'm a, a really 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 big fan of diversity and uh, and I need that to keep my brain working. Otherwise, homogeneous uh, stereotypical uh, life will you know kill my 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 spirit. And uh, in autumn, like now at the end of September, uh, we bring guests from all over Europe. To volunteer here in the reserve here they are listening to the red deer rot we have many deer here and it's you can play around uh, with different pictures just you know not always going for the the obvious here is the contrary of what i said at the beginning i like also very tight portraits so either very broad frames or very very tight ones and the pleasure of uh, berry picking sharing it with kids, or also photographing the local apple producer who has 18 varieties of apple, of which seven are endangered. Because yeah, there is also endangered agriculture. And um, by promoting a different uh, look at uh, ag agriculture, you can actually embrace rewilding. You can embrace uh, uh, biodiversity um, on your doorstep. We believe in a community where you uh trying to minimize the conflict with wildlife because you know having bears and deer close home sometimes can be a problem so we here we are more or less bear proof every garden every chicken pen is surrounded by electric fence and people are trained to deal with bears and there are no problem um, and uh, take the most out of this uh, opportunity that uh, this abandoned land actually is still there to teach us many many lessons and before concluding 
um, another uh, story, let's say close home, um, because a nature photographer never stops thinking of how you can use your imagery to promote conservation, to draw interest towards nature. Um, two years ago, I got the opportunity to test one of the Canon latest camera, very, very fast, wonderful camera, the, the R3, and I decided to bring it to the beach. Um, because uh, I am uh, so touched by the story of the Kentish flower. This is this little shorebird that every year comes to breed in uh, one of the world, the wildest places, which is Italian beaches in summer. You can imagine this animal now is still in a quiet moment, but in a few weeks, uh, this, this very bird will have to dodge hundreds of people and dogs and kids and uh, and umbrellas to find uh, its nest. It is This animal doesn't build a, a nest. It has uh, camouflaged eggs, which it lays on the ground. This is the way evolution has molded uh, this, this species behavior to survive. But when we go to the beaches nowadays, they're often cleaned and uh, every single piece of debris is removed because we don't like that. And the nests are exposed, exposed to crows, exposed to our our shoes or cats and dogs so volunteers have to locate this nest and put this ugly but necessary fences to protect the nest so the bird can still as you can see from tracks move in and out but at least uh, the, the eggs cannot be predated by crows and other predators because or gulls because they are so visible in a clean beach and uh, it's wonderful to witness uh, the birth of the chicks we're talking of a, of a bird that is maybe 16, 17 centimeters. So the chicks are really, really small and super fast. They can run 60 kilometers an hour. The real challenge for, for a photographer and a camera, you have to lay on your, on your belly, on your elbows, in the sand, trying to avoid to put sand on your cameras, which is very, very um, non-recommended. Uh, and photograph this fast bird. This, for example, it's the mother holding the chicks uh, in its uh, feather to keep them warm. And this is a chick running to me. You can see how tiny it is, but since they are born, they can immediately be independent and run around. And um, this was, uh, the, the testing of this camera um, was just, you know, another day in a nature photographer. I tried to transform this uh, opportunity to photograph an endangered bird and tell its story. And eventually it was cool because when Canon released this test, it was one of the first uh, field tests of this uh, new model and everyone was very keen on knowing about the camera, but I used, I took the plunge to have uh, a little, um, so to say, uh, plug in of conservation. And this is how I believe that we should uh, trying to pursue our passion, whether it's for ourselves to reconnect with nature, to have a daily moment of freedom and uh, focus, you know, the famous mindfulness, or whether it's to uh, pursue a more ambitious career as professional um, content creators or photographers. Uh, photography, it's about time that it's devoted at, uh, almost entirely to advocate for nature conservation. Thank you so much. Here you have my tag and here I have my website. Feel, feel free to drop me an email or a message and on due time I'll answer to you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruno. That was that was just a joy to listen to um, and view. It was visually incredible. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. My One pleasure. of them, um, I felt quite emotional going through your presentation. It started... Um, you know, with obviously your home, your hometown from when you were younger, but then when you moved into Berlin, the images that you took there were just that, that that's where that's what really got me. Um particularly the one that Lidl was just absolutely fantastic. I think it resonated with quite a few people. There was a lot of love hearts being shared during that moment. Um and we now have time for some questions and I see some um having come into the QA chat. So I will just uh, read them out for you. Um we have one um, that came in quite early. It said, um, I love the clean lines in your photographs. Do you pay special attention in placing them when you take the photograph? Thank you. This is an excellent question. I I have been, um, uh, I had the fortune to be assistant for a very famous photographer about 20 years ago, 
uh, Joel Sartori is a, is a legend of um, wildlife photojournalism. And he, while looking at my portfolio, he pointed out that often there would be the odd stick coming out of behind the head of my subject, or there would be the odd element coming into, into frame. And he said in a very American way, you should cool down when you take a picture, you know, you're just like to rush, take the time to um, to clean, perfect your composition. And I say, yeah, but you don't have that time. And he say, that's the trick. You must do it fast. And this is exactly what happens. After so many years of practice, it takes me a split second to have the cleanest composition or make use of a messy composition to create an interesting frame. So I don't know if that answers the question. Let's say that uh, the more... The older I, I get, the more I accept uh, odd elements out of focus, but trying to, to have this very clean eye. And how do you train this eye? Of course, taking a lot of pictures, looking at a lot of pictures and looking at paintings and go to exhibitions. Uh, you know, even painters uh, of the Renaissance, they already were really keen on composition. And that's an extremely fantastic uh, school that you can um, apply to without the need of a, of a real trainer. I hope I answered the question. Lovely. Do you have any particular artists that inspire you, Bruno? Oof, uh, super many. But I <laughs> think we, since we are talking to mostly an, uh, an English audience, I would say Turner is one of my most favorite ones for the courage of framing the subjects very, very tiny and giving also importance of cl to clouds and colors and storms. I think of his famous painting of Hannibal army crossing the Alps you see the army is very tiny, just you have to need, a, you need almost a magnifier. But then there's this massive snow squall cross, whipping through this, this canvas. It's amazing. And this is actually what, uh, and also it gives you the feeling that uh, what you're creating now is nothing new. We are just, you know, following in the footsteps of real giants. It's just that now the, the tools are there to be, to reduce so much the technical cumbersome uh, that to express yourself more freely and to pack your camera in your backpack without too much uh, thinking. Amazing. Thank you. That's one for everybody to look up if we haven't already. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another one come in, um, an anonymous question actually. Um, amazing shots. When you venture out into nature, do you normally focus on getting the one perfect still or do you approach your work thinking of more of a series or, or a sequence? Good, good point. I I work on projects more more often or stories, which means that you must collect different aspects. Normally, I do a lot of research. As a rule of thumb, one month in the field is equals three months of research. When I mean research, I mean talking to specialists, uh, look at all the books on the subject, sometimes Google images of places or species to see what's the, the baseline, what's the standard, and develop my shooting list. So uh, sometimes I develop an Excel file where I say, this is what I would like to photograph. This is more or less when it happens, and this is more or less where, and how I want to photograph it, technically speaking, and the chances. So if something is super difficult, I would give it more time. If something is very easy, I try to cross it, uh, take it very, very quickly in order to focus on something else. So I have an approach that is really, really organized. But then, of course, uh, that's my preparation. But then serendipity, it's playing always a role. Um, so let's say, uh, more or less, I know exactly or I envision what I like to photograph. And believe me, sometimes, not always, of course, mm -hmm. actually rarely, but sometimes it happens that the animal shows exactly where you want it because you have been there waiting. So if you know a specific bird very well and you know that the bird uses a certain patch and you know that in that patch there is, I don't know, a beautiful plant with uh, rose buds uh, or a rose hips and all colored and you, want, you wait for the bird to perch on that and then you take the picture. It's happening. It's an instant of a life on of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, an organism. You have to be there when it happens. And um, also, yeah, I couldn't stress uh, enough uh, um, the world uh, knowledge. Get to know a place. If you cannot travel, if you have the fortune to be close to a tiny forest or to a park, make that your patch. And as I, as I probably try to show you in Berlin or in my village, 
become the best photographer of that patch. And eventually that will actually draw more attention to your work than you expect if you will try to save every single penny uh, to fly to, to Masai Mara and be the, get in line to photograph the crossing of the wild wild the beast across the river. I don't do that. I mean, there are enough people doing that and you will never be satisfied <laughs> because the, the standards are very high. But your patch, that's pristine. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a wilderness compared to knowledge. So it's my spirit. It's incredible advice. I never really had considered the project management that goes on behind it all. So that was really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we have a question with quite a few more questions. There's one actually that aligns with what I was going to ask you. Um, so I'll ask it and just add to it. It's from Helen. It says, do you feel starting off as an ecologist gave you any advantage in wildlife photography? And I just add to it as well. Um, do you think growing up where you did helped you see the wildlife in the cities that perhaps others often miss or ignore? Okay, answer to the first question. Thank you for the questions again. Uh, yes, I do believe that my background uh, in ecology helps helps me to um, get uh, yeah the homework done properly in terms of uh, reading the papers, get to know the approach of scientists. Sometimes they are key. Scientists and specialists are key to access a certain species, either because the species is very elusive or rare, or because it's protected by law. You need uh, someone to mediate. So that's very useful. At the same time, I had to build my vision in terms of uh, design and art by myself. So I'm a self-taught, uh, so to say, uh, designer and, uh, and uh, a trained uh, ecologist. Some people approach nature photography from completely other fields. Some are, have done journalism, some are designers, and then they get to the same point. So there are many ways. This is my way, and I... I'm, I always like to have uh, every picture that I take, even the most, uh, uh, let's say, artistic, although it's, I hate this term, um, have a, a baseline of science. So they're all correct. So they try to be scientifically correct. But, you know, you can unleash yourself. But nature is always beautiful, even without embellishment. The second question uh, yes, of course, I had the fortune to be in a, enjoy some a rural area in a moment that was still quite pristine and gave me also, um, I could have developed early an awareness for uh, and a concern for urgency, urgency, urgency to protect nature. So I could see changes in my life. So that's important. My baseline helped me to see things. On one hand, it makes me a little bit sad and, wor and worried. On the other hand, it, it always puts me under pressure to do more. But um, I also want to break, uh, you know, uh, a spear in, in, uh, in favor of traveling photography. When I travel and I go to a new place, I'm also very quickly in the zone, so to say. I'm so focused because I'm far away from home, from my mundane, the most mundane things, aspects of my life. And that helps to be very focused. So actually, in a shorter time, you can do more work than you will ever do close home. So it's a trade-off. At home, maybe I know very well light and a yeah, single individual so I can be more successful. But uh, there is nothing like every now and then being on a, on a foreign mission and then really be like with all your sense and at, senses attuned to a new scenario. Thank you. I think, um, couldn't, yeah, that was very well answered. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very Good well. to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just have a couple more and we do still have a little bit of time. Um, Sophia would like to know Apologies, Bruno. Yeah, I'm there. I just cut off there, but I am back with you now. Um, we were just answering the last of the few questions, which were, uh, Sophia was wondering if you had any animals still on your bucket list, which you had not yet had the chance 
<laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Well, I have a very large, I would say, I don't have a bucket list. I have a swimming pool list of things that I would like to photograph. Let's say that uh, the actual scenario within nature photography is that so many incredible species have been uh, accessed uh, thanks to information and, and networking. Let, imagine a snow leopard. When I started, snow leopard was still the holy grail of a nature photographer. Now you can uh, lead tours and make sure that you are 100% sure to see one and photograph. So more than, than species, I have places that I would like to visit, especially... I like to visit the, the Middle East and some uh, remote areas of Africa where it's a bit tricky to get because uh, they still host uh, intact uh, set of species. So it's more like places. But yes, of course, uh, I, I have just completed a project on the Mediterranean monk seal, which is one of the most uh, endangered animals in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a few years ago, I thought it would have been impossible to even take a good photo and now here we are me and two colleagues we are just going on print with a new book and this was uh, it's always surprising because every species has a uh, as a access code so to say there is a place there is someone who knows the how to deal with them and knows the best location and then all of a sudden they are there and you just have to do your best to exp make good use of the opportunity and the fortune. So I have many species mm, to name. Well, I would like to travel and work in Iran, but it's very difficult at the moment. And I would like to photograph the Okapi. And I want to do this with my son because my son is eight years old and he shows the same passion as I, which I had. And he really wants to go to Congo and see an Okapi. So maybe, I don't know, in 20 years, I'll do the Okapi. When I was a kid, I wanted to photograph a fennec fox and 30 years later, I tried, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so that's wonderful to hear that your son is inspired also. Hopefully you've got a budding photographer. <laughs> yeah, actually I'm trying to keep him uh, away because I also know it's a, it's a very right. expensive activity. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and uh, you always have to carry heavy loads, but he likes to draw. So let's see, maybe we'll become a better illustrator than I was. <laughs> well, I'd just like to say thank you again. We do have five more minutes. So um, if anybody has a question that I have not answered or has a burning question they want to ask, please do pop it in the Q&A chat uh, now and I will make sure to read it out. But my last question for you, Bruno, would just be, have you seen over time in your career any particular climate change that you've been working on? For example, if you had to go back to a certain region which you, you'd previously been to say 10 years before. Have you, have, has anything been particularly stark for you? Yeah, this is a very appropriate question. Unfortunately, yes, everywhere. So when we discussed, talked before about planning, about the research, uh, again, uh, fortune, uh, so to say, uh, favors uh, the prepared mind. So to, that's uh, what Pasteur said. Uh, prepared mind means knowing and planning. Now it is very difficult to plan because so many natural cycles have been disrupted by the um, by climate change and uh, many shoots go bad because uh, things are not happening. Myself here in the Upper Nines where I have, uh, let's say, a lifelong experience, I'm witnessing the most crazy things. So on one hand, uh, I'm extremely worried, extremely worried. On the other hand, when I look at my children, I, I, I say we have to try to make the most out of it, to, to try to do our best to, to hinder this, this, the effects of this climate change. But uh, here in, in Italy, we are severely affected a lot. You know, extensive rains in moments when there should be no rain, very warm winters. Uh, uh, for example, there are no apples this year because uh, in spring, during the pollination, uh, pollinating, uh, pollination time, it was raining and cold every day and the bees didn't pollinate the trees. So right now there are no apples. The, the apple trees you saw in the pictures are devoid of apples. And that's why more bears are coming closer to villages because that's where some apples are. So there are a lot of cascades effects. This just to say that it's the new normality. We don't have to accept it, but we have to be aware. So part of me, has also started to enjoy nature in a very, very personal way. So let's say that uh, I want to treasure 
very much every beautiful moment I have in nature with certain species. Before I didn't have this feeling. Now I really do. And uh, so sometimes at the end of a shoot, I put aside my camera and I savor that moment for maybe two, three, five minutes just to say, make sure that your eyes record it, your heart, the sounds of it, the smell. Because the photography is beautiful, but sometimes it's a very immersive activity and mm -hmm. becomes a screen between you and the world. And uh, you, back in time, you remember the emotion, but then you go back to your pictures to redefine the, the let's say, the geography of the, that moment. And it's important to also exercise our, our senses to record, not only the cameras. It's, um, it's sad to hear that, um, but again, not really surprising. It was the answer I was expecting, but... Um, yeah, I really appreciate your sharing your experience of it also. Um, but, there was something... um, sorry, Anna, if I can add just a little yes, sentence more. Like from your project, the Tiny Forest, to uh, what we are doing here about uh, rewilding and uh, and uh, joining the, um, the agriculturalists to develop a different way of uh, managing the land. Nature, uh, in its complexity, um, develops resilience. And biodiversity is one of the best indexes we have to see that. So by working in terms of implementing biodiversity and green areas and diversity in our minds, I think we can create that kind of uh, resilience that we need. There's no other way, I think. Otherwise, we just give up and we we live until the very last day. That's not the way to approach it, no? <laughs> no, I still retain the hope. And I um, I wrote down, forgive me for paraphrasing, but what you said was, even in the awe of all your travels, um, the pleasure of daily connection to nature and noting the flowers coming into bloom is just priceless and an incredible reward for the work that you get to do. And it's one of the only ways that our children now can also connect with nature in this changing world, um, which I think is a really good way of, of summarising um, the topic that underlies what we were discussing today. And um, I know that we've now reached our time, but there is one last question in the chat. No so problem. I will bring it forever for you. Um, what do you think about the rising number of amateur wildlife photographers? Do professionalists see them as some kind of threat in terms of making a living, but also um, just perhaps um, the impact that it might be having on the nature spaces in which they are visiting? Quite a, a challenging question, I would say. It is because I'm finding for a politically correct answer. <laughs> no, and of course, stop uh, I mean, there is there is there is no there is no jealousy that there is cannot be any jealousy. No one owns anything. Um, I look at uh, interest uh, uh, at the rising growing number of nature photographers with uh, with wonder because, as I told you before, we started a webinar. When uh, I started doing nature photography in my early teens, it was a very odd activity. And actually, if I would tell this to a certain audience, it would lower my fitness. You know, I wouldn't have uh, many chances for a date by telling <laughs> a potential partner what I did on Sunday mornings or, or long sits in a hide, peeing in a bottle, you know, waiting for a kingfisher <laughs> to sit on a perch. So that was not really... Now I see this, this young people... Uh, taking selfies all in camouflage suit you know like uh, like we really like yo and I think oh, there's a world that's <laughs> changed so much but anyway apart from that I think it's great I think it's better to have people out there um, uh, watching nature and going by spending time in outdoors than, uh, than watching tv or hunting uh, as much as hunting can be also in a way an acceptable activity when it's uh, rightly done but of course, this doesn't have to come at uh, at the price of uh, destroying nature, putting extra pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Now in Italy, I live close to national parks. We're exp experiencing unsustainable numbers. So we are thinking of creating a license for nature photography, especially for endangered species or species which are very sensitive. They cannot uh, uh, accept human presence on a daily basis. Because what is the only message I want to send uh, all the photographers out there is that don't consider that what you do today is, uh, and, sorry, just keep in mind and what you do today can be replicated by someone else tomorrow and multiple times. So if you, if you stomp on a flower or you disturb a bird which is nesting, 
It could be, oops, I did it. Yes, but if this is happening every week and every week, because that's a very hot local patch where nature photographers go, then consider your, your footprint. And uh, I try to show you today pictures where animals are far away and framed, even with long lenses. Some of them have been awarded worldwide, have been published on the leading media. This means that it's not um, a handicap to stay close, farther from certain animals. It actually allows you to see more behavior because the animal is not aware of you. So my, my, my advice is do it properly, enjoy, spread the world, but always consider uh, the right moment and the right time to do certain things and never, ever share on a timely uh, fashion uh, sensitive information on social media. You never know whom is going to receive that message and that information. You never know what it's going to do. So always make sure that sensitive places remain within a, a scheme of trusted people. Because that's, unfortunately, that's how it is. Thank you, Bruno, so much for your Thank time. You. Um, Thank you so much. Really it's appreciate been a pleasure. It. It's been so much fun to have you here, even even at the end when we're talking about harder conversations, it has been a joy. And I'm really looking forward to next time. This is uh, part one of our two part webinar. So next time we will be um, going live at three o'clock again, um, UK time on um, in October, I apologize. 13th, 13th. 13th, yes, October yeah, 13th. Excellent. I'm gonna show you one of the most beautiful forests I came across here in Italy and how I had to overcome the difficulties of working in the forest to give it voice. And really because uh, I couldn't see the forest for the trees and I had to learn. So actually it's, uh, an, an, it's uh, a call to arms to people to overcome the apparent uh, emptiness of a forest too. And don't forget to take part to the competition, to the photo competition. It is very, very, it's much fun and you can, uh, you know, join this uh, amazing panel and, uh, and interact with people with uh, similarly minded people. So don't forget to take part. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much, Bruno. I've just put some information in the chat, some links for you to find additional information on everything we spoke about today. And don't forget to follow Bruno's work in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you all again. See you soon okay. and uh, be and go outside as much as you can. Yes. We have fun and nice autumn. See you in October. <laughs> See you in October. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Bruno. He is a photojournalist and filmmaker with a strong focus on wildlife and nature conservation. The background in wildlife ecology, he has a passion for the diversity of life across our incredible world. He has worked as a full-time nature photographer now since 2004 and is proud to be a Canon ambassador. Please sit back, relax and enjoy this wonderful presentation. <laughs>